time for another edition of Facing the Issues. Nice having you join us. It's almost 20 years since attempts were made to get a new constitution for Anguilla. The last legislative assembly procedure rules of 1976 under the Anguilla Constitution Order of 1982 was put together. And uh, since then, we've been struggling. Anguilla has struggled with attempts to get a new constitution for the island. And uh, one of the persons who actually took the lead or was at the forefront of ensuring that we get one of those constitution, of course, after instructions from executive council and governments, is Mr. Don Mitchell, CBEQC, who is now the chairman of the Constitutional and Electoral Reform Committee. It wasn't called that in the, in the early stages, but he's now the chairman of the Constitutional and Electoral Reform Committee, which was set up in September last year by Executive Council of this new administration, the Anglo United Front Administration. Don, we want to thank you very much. I know you're a sh busy man now, even though you say you're retired. <laughs> Thanks for coming and sharing with us an update, actually, on the constitutional and electoral reform exercise that's going on. Thank you, Wycliffe. As right. usual, it's a pleasure to be here. Right. Let's look first, Don, at the composition of the committee. We'll take us through. Um, this new administration, the Anglo Island Front Executive Council, September last year. Give us a bit about the composition of the committee and then in your own words, sure. what is the mandate that you've been given? Sure, the, the committee consists essentially of three different groups. There is a core group that the Executive Council selected that includes such persons as a representative of youth, uh, various persons that the Executive Council thought would be interested in law reform, and I can give you the names. That's the first group. The second group are the senior lawyers in Angola, the Queen's Council in Angola, that is. And the third group are representatives of every political party and political group in Angola. That wasn't the way it was when you started in 19, uh, what, nine, when David Carty was the first chair in 1997. You came on board in 2006. It was just one blank set of persons, as if well, I call them blank, just blank set of names. Why did you decide to go this way? Well, it's a conclusion that you've come to, that it was one cohesive group, is what I think you mean. We don't yeah. know what the thinking, I don't know what the thinking was of Executive Council. They may have wanted different parts of the society to be represented, but they had a group, and they, that was the group that David Carty headed. It included lawyers and politicians and people who were interested in constitutional reform. The 2006 commission which sat after the David Carty committee sat, consisted again of lawyers and, polit and politicians and other people who Executive Council thought were interested. This is the third group uh, that they have set up, and it, it deliberately groups together what we now know are uh, the three groups, group uh, persons from, from the society generally, not necessarily lawyers, lawyers. Uh, the lawyers, and the um, politicians, the political interests, who, because it's electoral reform, they, it is executive council must have recognized that they would have a concern that the boundaries wouldn't be altered. Could, they, nobody could allege that the boundaries were being altered or the number of voters in each district were being altered in order to give one political group an advantage over another, to ensure transparency and fairness it would have been obvious that you needed to have all of the politicians involved. On board. On board. The, the mm -hmm. first committee was set up in 1997. Approximately. Uh, approximately around mm -hmm. that time. That was headed by David Carty, a par former parliamentary secretary, mm -hmm. uh, former speaker. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 2006, we had another one set up. That was the first committee that you chaired. Mm -hmm. And those two were set up under the Angola United Front administration. Yes. And then we had a change in 2010 when the Angola United Movement That's came on correct. board. And the committee then was chaired by the Reverend John A. Gums. Mm -hmm. And then we also had one by the Reverend Dr. H. Clifton Niles. These were the two uh, under the Angola United Movement administration. So we had between 2010 and 2015 uh, two committees. And then we had 
in last year, 2015, uh, the committee, they came back to you, Don. Basically, after all those reports and, you know, a lot of them wasn't published, we didn't hear a lot about them. What specifically can you tell our viewer is the mandate, as you see it, of this current commission? Well, the mandate is first and foremost set out in the AUF political manifesto on which they fought the last campaign that's specifically in there. And when Executive Council took the decision to set up this new committee, we were, we were given a copy of the page from the manifesto and were told, this is your mandate. And as I understand it, the principal objective of the present administration is to secure such constitutional reform and upgrading of the Constitution as we and eventually the government believes will be acceptable to the people of Anguilla or indeed are wanted by the people of Anguilla. So not to go backwards and make it worse, not to go so far forward that nobody in Anguilla is happy with what we are recommending, but just to find out by consultations with the public what it is that the people really want. We already have a pretty good idea, 20 years of dealing with the community by so many different people in Anguilla has caused sentiments to surface on radio, television, in newspaper articles, in conversations in the public street, in conversations in supermarkets, in conversations with representatives of the various committees. It has begun to become apparent, to me at least, where the people of Anguilla want to go. What we have to do is to take the best from the draft, con from the report of 2006, from the draft constitution that Mrs. Lolita Richardson did for Mr. Hubert Hughes, which was never published, but we have copies of it. The members of the committee have, have been given copies of it by, by the administration because they have copies in the government files. Then we've been given copies of uh, Reverend John Gums's draft constitution. We, are all, we all have that and we are considering it. Our very next meeting is going to be looking at all of these constitutions. But anyway, after Reverend Gums, there was, as you mentioned, the Reverend Dr. Niles's constitution. Of which Dr. Again, Niles committee. Doctor, of Dr. Uh, Niles's not committee. Not necessarily Dr. Niles's constitution. Yes. But well, the well, committee which he headed. Well, it, let us say that, yes. Let us say that it was the draft constitution of his committee. But that forms one of this package. All of us have this big package. And uh, our program, which we, have which we have agreed on, requires us to sit down and look at the good British Overseas Territories constitutions, the modern ones, such as the Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, and Turks and Caicos, and Montserrat. They have, within the last five years, they've all upgraded their constitutions and their administrations and their people have improved democratic principles mm -hmm. embedded in those updated constitutions that we don't have. Our constitution is pretty much an outdated one in terms of us having a pure colonial status with very few, if any, powers for our ministers and our House of Assembly and our institutions, our Public Service Commission, for example, only exists to give the governor such limited advice as the governor may ask for. I have no doubt some governors rely on the advice of the Public Service Commission, but there may be others who don't bother, and they aren't required to bother with any of these institutions. If Angola is going to grow democratically, if we are going to grow in maturity, if we are ever going to arrive one day at the state where we are practiced and experienced at running our own affairs, then we have to have greater emphasis placed on local democratic institutions that improve the powers of the people to govern themselves. That's, I think we all agree that that is essential. But having looked at yourself as chairman, I'm sure you do more work than the others would do as you carry a process forward. And you mentioned a number of the overseas territories who have already completed their exercise. Do you think, from what you've been able to glean, that it's probably the wish of the British that the uniform constitutions across the territories? No, the British have a historical recognition that each of these island territories has its own history and its own background. 
and the constitution of, for example, the Virgin Islands and Cayman Islands, both of which are very ancient colonies, are completely different from each other. So that we have no reason to believe that they would want us to have the same constitution as the Virgin Islands or the same one as Cayman. I'm going to make an example which is only a theoretical example to show you what I mean. It could be that in the Virgin Islands, they recognize the right of people of the same sex to have a civil relationship. And that may be in the Virgin Islands Constitution. I'm not saying it is, because I don't remember, quite frankly. But it could be that Cayman Islands is dead against that, and the British have not forced that on the Cayman Islands. They leave it for the people of each territory to work out for ourselves what is it that we want in the Constitution, and then they negotiate it with us. Remember, they have only one interest. The British have only one interest. And that is that so long as we are British overseas territories, we shouldn't have the power to be able to embarrass them by doing things, performing actions, passing laws, making decisions that they are going to be embarrassed by. I mean by that, that they're going to have to pay money large sums of money if we can't afford to pay it. That's their real concern, their only real interest in the overseas territories that I have been able to understand. I may be wrong, but from my point of view, the only real interest that the British have in the overseas territories is that we're, we are essentially a political and psychological burden on them. The United Nations and other international groupings, including the European Commission, keeps warning the British that they must get rid of all these colonies. The British have said they agree, they want to do that, but under no circumstances will they force an overseas territory to go independent. They are, will, they are perfectly willing to negotiate with any British overseas territory that wants to go independent. They will be happy to give it because it will mean less pressure on them from the European Union and the United Nations. So they're waiting for us to come up with recommendations, with a plan, with a draft constitution, and they will then check it carefully to see if there is anything that we have put in that is going to cause them to get into trouble with their international obligations. So long as there isn't that problem, I don't see us having any difficulty in getting what we ask for. Don, it's almost 20 years since this exercise, if we call it that, started. Are you surprised that it has taken so long to be completed? And what do you think has caused this delay? It's purely politics. The problem we have in Anguilla is that there is a fierce political division within the community. The Anguilla United Movement is a powerful political party. I know that the leaders of the AUM have made it a point of honor to say that they are not a party, they're a movement but that is playing with people's minds. That is not talking sense. Similarly, the AUF calls itself a force. It doesn't call itself a party, but of course it's a powerful political party, and the people of Angola are split between those two political parties, so that whatever one does, when the other one gets into power, it undoes it, and it happens every time the administration changes. So that if this committee has not completed its exercise and its recommendations for changes to the Constitution put into constitutional effect by the time this administration comes to an end, then it is guaranteed that every stroke of work that this committee has done will be consigned to the rubbish bin by the new administration of whatever kind that comes into office. Let's look at the timetable though. We're going to be coming back to a number of the areas that your committee We'll be looking at, but uh, you, you struck a good note there. Let's look at a timetable for the Constitution. Now, you can, you've already given a deadline in December last year, your committee, to come up with certain things. This was done. Um, how long do you think there are, or has been the norm for a, from the start, from the time the administration announces a committee and the start of, and the end of a Constitution? Well, I can't say how the others functioned. The group of us professionals and business people and politicians who got together in 2006, 
we function smoothly and seamlessly and we work together. It's not true that I did most of the work. On the contrary, take for instance right now, Constitutional and Electoral Reform Committee. The electoral reform which the supervisor of elections and the international observers who were here during the last election, they came up with recommendations for changes that must take place in Angola's electoral system. But don't, not, not, not to um, disrupt you there, but a number of the, the changes that were given this last time were changes that were on the books long time. Not official, because the supervisor of election in the past, Carville Petty, he had made a number of recommendations. So the, have, have, being someone who's been involved in the electoral process in terms of being a returning officer, a number of the recommendation that the, the last, um, or the current supervisor of election, took to the fore and the committee, and the observer team, for recommendations that were made from long time. Yes, but these are recommendations for changing the law, not just recommendations for changing practice. Yeah, what I'm saying is that this was recommendation for changing the law from long time. The fact is that none of the administrations of, of the past, as yes. they say, had the balls. That's quite, to go quite right, ball. quite right. The point I wanted to make is that Christy Richardson, who is the representative on our committee from the Anguilla United Movement, and Keisha Carty, and one or two others, I think Stachel Warner maybe, um, maybe Mary Horsford from Pam's um, group, and uh, one or two others, I think Alistair Richardson from the Dove Party, they have formed a subcommittee and they are working actively on recommendations for electoral reform. So the elections committee of our committee, the elections subcommittee of our committee, have been delegated with responsibility to look at the recommendations from Mr. Colville Petty, the recommendations from the present supervisor of elections, and the recommendations from the observer team. And then they are to look at the laws of the Virgin Islands, which deal with uh, part constituency election and part at large election, the laws and regulations of Montserrat, which deal with entire country being proportionally elected, and they are to look at the regulations and laws of St. Kitts and Antigua, which are purely uh, constituency or district representatives, and they are to take the best from them and to come up with recommendations for whatever they think is going to be the best mix for Anguilla. The committee as a whole will look at it and will decide what we want to recommend to the Executive Council. And the laws that would need to be put in place, they already exist in different parts of the Commonwealth Caribbean, very close to us. An experienced legal draftsman cannot take as much as a month, I would say two weeks maximum, to come up with the changes that need to be made to the laws of Anguilla and the regulations of Anguilla in order to give effect to whatever it is that we recommend. It does not need to be a lengthy process. It's only a lengthy process if people don't do what they're supposed to do. Uh, chairman of the Constitutional and Electoral Reform Committee, Don Mitchell, is our guest on tonight's um, Facing the Issues. He mentioned one of the subcommittees as part of this overall committee. When we come back, we will look at some of the other subcommittees and find out what they have to do. This is Facing the Issues. Washing your hands is the best way to stop the spread of germs. Wash them before eating, preparing food or taking care of a baby, and after coughing, sneezing, handling pets, or using the bathroom. 
Here's how to wash your hands. Wet hands with clean water. Apply soap. Rub hands together vigorously for 20 seconds. Long enough to sing happy birthday. Pay special attention to the back of the hands between the fingers, fingernails, fingertips and thumbs. Rinse hands with clean running water. Air dry by shaking off excess water. Turn off the tap with paper towel or tissue. Dry hands with paper towel or tissue. Open the bathroom door with a paper towel and then dispose in the bin. You can also use hand sanitizers or wipes. Keep your hands clean to prevent the spread of germs. A lot of people think that fast books are cool and the girls show like the guys who write them. But like so many things about life, you gotta be careful. Having sex without a condom is like riding a bike without a helmet. It's just plain dumb. It's okay to have fun as long as you're smart about it. My name is Daniel the Lion Fortress, and I'm different, and I'm making a difference. Live up, love, protect, respect. This is Facing the Issues. Our guest this evening is Don Mitchell QC, who is the chairman of the Electoral and Constitutional Reform Committee. Uh, when we went to the break, Don was talking about um, some of the various subcommittees that have been formed as a result of this new exercise. Don, what's another one? Well, it's a bit complicated. We had originally intended to do one thing, and now we decided at our last meeting to do something different. So let me tell you what we had originally decided. We had decided to have a subcommittee on fundamental rights, another subcommittee on nationality issues, belongership and that sort of thing, one on the composition of the House of Assembly, whether we should have nominated members, whether the ex officio members should continue to have a vote, that sort of thing. And then another committee on the distribution of executive powers. What should be the powers of the ministers, for example? Another one on legislative powers, how the House of Assembly should function. Another committee on checks and balances. There's a lot of interest in Anguilla on the watchdog institutions, or what the Turks and Caicos Constitution calls institutions to promote good governance. Another committee that we wanted to set up was the Committee on the Public Service, how the public service should be uh, hired, uh, disciplined, and uh, governed. And then finally, a committee on the electoral process. The only one that we were able to have functioning was the electoral subcommittee. So as the minutes indicate, uh, the minutes that are before you indicate, we have now decided that starting from our next meeting, the whole committee is going to act as the subcommittee for all of these other areas. And how do you respond to those who will argue and have argued that after 20 years, the only changes to the Constitution are likely to be in the area of electoral reform? I've heard that comment. Uh, I know that the average man on the street has many more important things that confronts him or her in their daily life than constitutional reform. I know that. It doesn't have a high priority. There are a few lawyers, a few public servants, a few retired public servants, and very few members of the community who, are not, who don't fit into any of those categories who have any interest in any aspect of constitutional reform. It is not a high priority for the man on the street or the woman on the street who's trying to earn a living, send their kids to school, get proper health services, and all the other bread and butter important issues. We know that. We know that. So that it is true that there isn't much interest in all of these areas. But a lot of work has been done on them. And some of them could be very beneficial to developing Anguilla's democracy, developing a, a, a better civil society. The principles of democracy could be embedded in our constitution better. We could become more expert, more adept at governing ourselves. We could hold our elected officials to a higher standard. We all know that right now, when a budget is passed, even though the officials say 
that each department is obliged to stick within the budgeted amounts. We know that they go outside that. We know that ministers of government waive taxes and levies that they have no power to do. They tell developers that they're not going to have to pay certain taxes. They're going to give them concessions. They go to the House of Assembly and they get some of them passed, but not all of them. They behave in a way that is totally financially irresponsible. So much so that the British have threatened to bring discipline into Angola's financial administration by sending in a British financial administration officer who will have superpowers in an over and exceeding the constitution to rein in the poor administration of, Ang of Angola by our public service. None of us wants that. Indeed, I suspect none of us will accept that. We, therefore, have to do it for ourselves. We have to improve our constitutional safeguards and restrictions so that it is clearly illegal for our permanent secretaries and our ministers of government to misuse public funds. And to, by misuse, I mean use them for purposes which the legislature did not approve. At the moment, the Angola public finance operates as a giant slush fund. Money is approved, for example, for the Ministry of Education, but it's not approved, and, the, and if it is approved, it's not enforced on a line-by-line -line basis. If an emergency arises in the Ministry of Education and money is needed for an emergency, hundreds of thousands of dollars are needed for an emergency, it is simply taken from somewhere else in the budget and spent on that emergency, which is illegal. What is required by our present Finance and Audit Act, which is not obeyed, it's completely ignored, is that government come back to the House of Assembly with a supplementary appropriations budget. Every other island in the West Indies comes to the House of Assembly and gets approval to spend money in areas where it was not previously approved, even if in retrospect, even if the approval is after the event, they get it done in order that their auditor, the government's auditor, can certify that parliament did approve every expenditure. I think all of us now know, because we've been talking about it for years, that the chief auditor of Angola has never in the history of Angola been able to give a clean certificate for Angola's public accounts. The last financial report for Angola, published in October of last year, was the report for 2011. The accounts for 2011 were finally published in about October 2015. The chief auditor reports that no government department properly tracks where its income is coming from. That means there is no proper receipting of the money so that no department of government can clearly indicate what money it received completely in total. There is not a government department, it appears, from reading the report, which I did, there's not one department of government that can account for where it spent its money. Money goes out of the public service in ways that are not accounted for. This is such an appalling state of affairs that the chief auditor for Angola, year after year, has criticized it, has commented on it, and Mr. Banks must take credit. He is the first minister of finance who has published that chief auditor's report. It's on the government website. Anybody can get a copy of it. You only have to read the chief auditor's certificate, which is about two pages long, to get a grasp of the terrible state of our public financing accounts. And we believe in the committee and, and in the society generally, I think people believe that we need to tighten up our constitution to impose stricter financial controls on our ministers of government and our public service. And I think that that's a priority. Don, our current constitution, the um, legislative assembly procedure rules, I can put it close there for whatever you can read of it, was 
done in 1982, completed in 1982. This is the one that we're using now. And that before that, we had one in 1976, which a number of Anguillians and the wider Caribbean and overseas territories have regarded as one of the most advanced constitutions um, in the territories. That was one uh, he told me was um, that Bonus Lake, the late Dame Bonus Lake had a hand in. Uh, how, how, how do you see, what are some of the areas from the 1976 Constitution, which we all regard was the most advanced in the territories, and did not make it to the current one? Well, in 1976, Anguilla had a different constitutional status to the status we have now. So the 1976 Constitution reflected Anguilla's constitutional status. All Anguillians remember that St. Kitts didn't go independent until 1982. Under the 1980 agreement between the Anguilla government, the British government, and the St. Kitts and Nevis government, it was agreed that St. Kitts would give up its associated state status and become fully independent with Nevis. And Anguilla would revert to full colonial status. That was agreed. Any Anguillian born in, any Anguillian who was living in St. Kitts on the date of separation of the two countries would receive full St. Kitts citizenship. Any Kittitian living in Anguilla on the date of separation would receive full belonger status. So the separation didn't affect the rights of the people of the two different countries, but the constitutional status changed. So the 1976 Constitution, which Dame Bernice Lake and other Anguillians had a role in drafting and agreeing with the British government, was an associated state constitution. Anguilla was a part of the associated state of St. Kitts, Nevis, and Anguilla, being administered directly by the British as an associated state. So that under the 1976 Constitution, as an associated state, ministers had considerable power. They could tell the governor what to do. The House of Assembly of Anguilla had considerable power. It could pass laws. The Public Service Commission of Anguilla had considerable power. It advised the governor who the governor must appoint to various positions. But once Anguilla became a colony, all of those powers were taken away. And Anguilla received a full colonial constitution so that, for example, who is the legislature of Anguilla? Everybody will say the House of Assembly. But if you read the 1982 Constitution, it states quite clearly that the legislature for Anguilla shall be the queen through her representative, the governor. The members of the House of Assembly only exist to advise the governor on what laws the governor should pass. So the legislature of Anguilla is the governor, helped out, so to say, by our legislative assembly. It's a sort of a facade of democracy. It's not real democracy. I think we would all agree that that should really change. Anguillians should be the only ones who can make Anguillian laws. If the British want to make a British law to affect us, then they can go ahead and do that. But they shouldn't have any say in passing laws for Anguilla. At the moment, the governor of Anguilla can make a law for Anguilla that the House of Assembly has not approved. Similarly, if you check the constitution of Anguilla for the executive, the executive of Anguilla is the governor acting for the queen. So in Antigua or in St. Kitts, the executive of Anguilla is the cabinet, the executive council or cabinet. They constitute the head of the executive. In Anguilla, it's the queen acting through the governor who is the executive. Ministers of government, they are only appointed so long as the governor thinks it's a good idea. By the governor, I really mean the British government. So long as the British government approve, then the governor will appoint ministers. But the governor doesn't have to listen to anything that the ministers say. Why is that so? because we have a full colonial status. Now, the fact is that most governors do not abuse the power that the Constitution gives them. Most governors would prefer to do things that Anguillians approve of, 
which means passing the laws that the Legislative Assembly or the House of Assembly pass, making executive decisions that the ministers of government want to be made, that makes government run smoothly and without friction. We all in Anguilla, in Anguilla know what happens when friction arises between ministers of government who don't understand the limits of their power and the role of a minister in Anguilla, and a governor who is determined not to take nonsense, as the governor would call it, from the ministers. And we don't appreciate having such a confused situation continuing to prevail in Anguilla. We believe that it is time that the Constitution sets out in a better way what are the clear powers of the ministers, and they should have real powers. And our House of Assembly should have real powers. And there should be new Legislative Assembly rules which set out in greater detail because this is only a skeleton. This is a jokey. These rules are quite jokey because remember they're 30 and more years old. They're not modern parliamentary um, rules. So we want them updated. All so, so having alluded to the fact that these rules are outdated, they're old, 1982, uh, and what's in the Constitution, you, you hit, hint at one which talks about the governor's powers, former chief minister would always say that the governor had all the power. Um, you said no governor does, was not or will not go as far as abusing the powers that the Constitution gave him, but the former chief minister don't think that way. Oh, I know, but the former chief minister had a difficult role in the administration. He, had, he was faced with a crisis. And my reading of the situation is that the chief minister decided that the way to get the people of Anguilla to not criticize him and his administration was to create a foreign or external enemy. We all know the principles of warfare and the principles of political science. If you want to rally the people around you to an unpopular or even untruthful cause, mm -hmm. find an outside enemy. If you can aim the people in that direction, you are safe. And that was the strategy that the former chief minister followed as I analyze it. That's just my opinion. Okay. One of the areas, Don, which has also surfaced the fact that why we are not, have, have been able to get a constitution as yet, has a lot to do with the, of course, the governor's power, so much you're going to get from that, and the whole question of full internal self-government. You want, to, you want to talk about that? Well, full internal self-government as a slogan, not as a reality, as a slogan, is a no-go. No There's no hope that we in Anguilla can go to the British and say we want full internal self-government. We can do it, and the British can agree, but they have stated repeatedly that they will only agree within the context of a timetable for full independence. Because full internal self-government, full real internal self-government means that we can misuse, for example, all of our treasury money and use it for gambling in the casinos in St. Martin without anybody being able to control us. And the British will have no say in that. The British have said, I'm sorry, when you're independent, you can go and gamble all the money you want. You can thief all the money you want, but you're not doing it so long as you are a British overseas territory. So we have to respect their clearly stated and very understandable reasons for the position that they have taken. But we know that we can get the same rights for local Anguillian institutions that they allowed the Bermudan people to get. We are entitled to the same freedoms and the same self-government that BVI has or that Cayman has. Cayman is a full colony. So is the BVI. But yet they have rights in, and democratic institutions of local self-government in many areas that we could handle in Anguilla quite comfortably. I'll give you one. In Anguilla, the governor is the mercy committee. If someone is in prison for 30 years and the chief prison officer, the superintendent of prisons, believes that this person should be paroled or should be 
let go. Well, we now have a parole board. You remember the last governor, Harrison, managed to get a parole board put in place because he did not believe that the governor should be the only one having the authority. But if it's not a case of parole, if it's a case of pardon, remember parole is not pardon. Mm -hmm. Parole, you're still serving your time, but parole means word. You have given your word that you will behave when you are let go. And if you misbehave and commit another offense, you're coming back in to finish the term you were originally serving. But a pardon, allowing you to go free, is what a pardon means. Only the governor is the Mercy Committee of Angola. Now, what does a governor from London know about people in Angola and conditions in Angola and what is the right way to exercise such a discretion? The governor must depend on locals to advise the governor. Otherwise, it can't function. Well, in BVI and in Cayman, there is a committee of very responsible local citizens who tell the governor, they advise the governor on who should be pardoned. A governor is grateful for that. The governor doesn't want to have to get to know all the details of every person who's in prison who should be pardoned. Governor has more things to do than to worry with that. But if there is a committee that can concentrate on that, a governor would be happy to take that advice. The British are not going to object to us having a pardon committee appointed to tell the governor who should get a pardon after serving a sufficient number of years. There are a number of areas you have alluded to, Don, in your presentation so far in terms of you know, suggested changes that are likely to come to the Constitution. When we come back, we want to look a little bit more at finance and the Angular Financial Administration order. Tell us what you know about it and how will it affect Angola. This is facing the issues. Don Mitchell is the chair, current chair of the Constitutional and Electoral Reform Committee. This is facing the issues. When life moves fast, you need something to keep up with you. That's why you need the MyLime app. Remember the days of lining up to top up your phone? Well, not anymore. Now you can top up to start talking the night away. How about those pesky bills for postpaid? If you'd like to look at your entire bill, press download. Do you have that friend that always spams you for phone credit? Let's send them some credit. Need to post your selfies online? How about getting a data bolt on? Using the MyLime app takes less than 10 seconds. Now go forth and text, WhatsApp, and watch videos. My life, my way, my lime. In case of an earthquake, and the place that's shaking, shaking. Drop, cover, and hold on. Drop, cover, and hold on. In case of an earthquake, there's a few tips that can keep you from harm. In case of an earthquake, you gotta stay calm. Move away from doors, windows, and things that can fall. Try not to use steps or elevators at all. Protect your head on your face, don't go running all over the place. Cover under a bed or a table, against the wall that's firm and stable. Hold on, you must hold on, don't panic, stay calm. Don't move until the shaking stops. Here it is. Drop, cover, and hold on. Drop, cover, and hold on, in case of an earthquake. Drop, cover, and hold on. Learn how to protect yourself during an earthquake. Log on to weready.org. That's W-E-R-E-A-D-Y dot O-R-G for more information. The amount of salt you'll find in many prepared foods will shock you. Too much salt leads to high blood pressure, which in turn can cause heart attack and stroke. Canned meats, soups, chips, sauces, seasonings, all can have loads of salt. Always check the labels on products you buy. Avoid any item with more than 10% of the recommended daily amount. Control your blood pressure by lowering your salt intake. Salt, the silent killer. Cut down on salt. This is Facing the Issues. Our guest is Don Mitchell, CBE QC, who's chairman of the Constitutional and Electoral Reform Committee. His committee was appointed or 
given the, the, the go-ahead to at least try and complete an exercise that has gone on for the, for the last 20 years, um, in last year by the Executive Council. At the break, we mentioned that we're going to look in this segment, or part of this segment, at the Angola Financial Administration Order, parts of which Don has already alluded to. Uh, but Don, how do you see the fact now that the Public Accounts Committee, which is headed by the leader of the opposition, and she, her pledge to, to, you know, to do a little bit more work will affect what comes under the Angola Financial Administration Order? It will affect it. It will, um, it will be the first legislative, um, I don't want to call it watchdog, but let's call it a watchdog. It'll be the first watchdog institution that we will ever have had in Anguilla for the monitoring of public accounts. But remember, the, the accounts that are being monitored by the Public Accounts Committee and by the Chief Auditor are several years old. They're not monitoring what's happening this year. They can't because there are no reports or accounts for them to refer to. So it's difficult for a public accounts committee or a chief auditor to deal with current financial problems. The, the, the order, the draft order which the British were threatening to impose would deal with today. When a mistake occurs today, they will cure it tomorrow, not five or six years afterwards. So then, but then how, how effective then would be the current PAC. It's if very they, effective. If they're looking, if they're going to be looking at, at and, um, things that have done four or five years ago. Well, it's going to be very effective because crimes that are committed, offenses that are committed, wastage that is committed can be publicized and uh, public officers who participated and cooperated with ministers in siphoning off funds for unauthorized private um, projects of ministers that they wanted to do but is can that, be held is to that account. Is easy to, 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 to come up with? Though? Yes, if you, see, if you see the permanent secretary's signature on he's a voucher, a he officer. will be made, he, he, he will be debated up, his name will be called in the House of Assembly, criticisms will be made of him. I can't, I won't, the Public Accounts Committee can't bring a charge against him, but they could make it very embarrassing for the ministers involved. They may now be in opposition, but when they are exposed as having been profligate and wasted Anguilla's money, they can't come back to the people and say that they are going to be better next time. Not easily. Well, they could do that. But they who, could do who that. Believe they, right. you know, could believe that. Right. No, what, they, what this draft order was going to do was, it can be summarized this way. The draft order was, first of all, going to force the local government to agree a fiscal framework. We have one at the moment done by a law which the Angola government passed very reluctantly under the Hubert Hughes administration. But this fiscal framework is going to be one which is so binding that any step that any government department takes which does not comply with the fiscal framework that is agreed by the government of Angola can be stopped the governor will simply send a memo to the permanent secretary saying, I order you to stop that project. You will not be allowed to do it anymore. The, 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 the chief financial officer, whose name I forget for the moment, he is the one that the governor will be getting advice from. He will tell the governor, I have been monitoring the accounts of these departments and you have leakage in this area. You need to consider transferring certain civil servants because they are not acting honestly in the best interests of the people of Anguilla. You have some people in there who are siphoning off money, and the governor will be able to transfer them without referring to anybody. If there's a board, the Anguilla Electricity Board or the Anguilla Social Security Board that is not fulfilling their responsibilities according to law, the governor, acting on the advice of the chief financial officer, will simply fire them and will appoint the persons that the governor thinks will act more responsibly. But some of these boards, Don, are Private boards, statutory boards. Not private boards, the statutory, statutory boards. Statutory boards. Yeah, but the, the, the order takes the form of a new constitution which overrides all existing legislation. So if the Anglic Act says that the minister shall appoint members of the board, the new order... I don't think it does that. 
But if it doesn't, that's good. But some some law gives the minister the power to appoint the government representatives onto the board. I Those mean, that have private shareholders have yeah. a few directors. That has surfaced on it ever since the last... The, the, um, well, then let's the take one that's fully government, the, yeah, the Health Authority health of Angola. Authority, yeah. Health Authority of Angola. The Health Authority Act says that the minister appoints all the members of the board. Maybe the governor acting on the advice of the minister. But they can waste a lot of money. I heard the Minister of Health saying that we have been sending away private citizens who have gone and gotten themselves shot on the street or somewhere or the other. We've spent a million dollars already this year, I think I heard him say, sending them to Panama or some place in the world where they're going to get some kind of high class medical treatment. Instead of us insuring ourselves, getting our own private health insurance and treating our own wounds, we are looking to wasting the public money to get private medical health benefits for private citizens, and it is very expensive. I'm not sure whether the people of Anguilla agree that that is a good way to spend our money. So if we go to the hospital, we can't get an anesthetic because all the money has been used up to send a John Brown's son off to Panama at the cost of $200,000 to get private medical treatment. I'm not sure how many of us agree that that is the right way to spend money. Especially but, when, when there's a failure and big noise to pay taxes. Especially when there's some big boys, big, big boys, including some of the biggest investors in Anguilla, who we are permitting not to pay their taxes. We all know that. So what, what the committee is thinking of doing, we haven't made a recommendation as yet, what we are thinking of doing, this has come out in the meetings, is that all of the safeguards in the public finance administration order, we want them in our constitution. We want our constitution to say that if the minister of finance misspends money, the governor can fire the minister of finance and rescind all of the orders that the minister of finance gave. And we, the people of Anguilla, will give the governor that power. We don't need the British to do it for us. But have, having, it is not part of the, it's just a recommendation here. Like yeah, but that's what we are thinking about. Thinking about. But there, there'll come a time when there's a number of recommendations that the committee, uh, after a lot of study and a lot of, you know, have gone through and decided that public is best for the country. But then it doesn't end there because you've got to take these recommendations to the public. And if the public say, no, where do you stand? Well, that's right. The mandate from Executive Council is that we must go through all of these constitutions from BVI and Cayman Islands. We must go through the constitutions that Reverend Gums and Reverend Niles and Lolita Richardson and others drafted up. And we must come up with something that we think that the people will approve of. But now we have to show Exco why we think that the people approve of it. Obviously, that involves consultation. It involves going to the public. It involves holding all sorts of public forums and town hall meetings and doing whatever we need to do to get the government, the executive council, to have an appreciation for what the people want. Because executive council is politicians. They don't want to go and do something that is going to make them look bad when the next elections come up. So we can guarantee that they are going to want to be assured that what we are proposing has public approval. Are there any uniform areas by that I mean? Are there any areas from the David Carty report, from the Don Mitchell report, from Reverend Gum's report, from Clifton Nye's report that are uniform from Don Mitchell report that, you know, saying the same thing? And then how do you expect to deal with those? Yes, well, from my own private reading, I can answer the question. But remember, the committee hasn't yet researched them. I remember I told you that's yeah. what we're going to do. Yeah, looking that at is, all that the is what we're going to do. But just from general knowledge, we know that that is so. We know that everybody recommends that, for example, the public service ought not to be legally and constitutionally under the total control of one person. It happens to be the governor, but it's one person. I think we all know that that must be undemocratic. In fact, governors feel so bad about it that they insist on taking the advice of public service commissions, even though the Constitution says they're not bound to, because they don't want that burden. They don't really know. They want locals to tell them what is best for the country. So we all agree that the Public Service Commission ought to consist of people who are trained in public administration, people who go through training in ethics and 
how to avoid a conflict of interest, and how to behave ethically in making recommendations, and how to ensure that you act always with the public interest at heart, to advise the governor. And in the Constitution, it should say, and I think we all, all of the different groups agree on that, it should say that the governor shall take the advice of the Public Service Commission. And there are plenty of other areas like that. There is the Judicial Services Commission, which appoints the magistrate. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Chief Justice is the chair of that. But the governor, um, the governor doesn't have to follow the advice of the Judicial Services Commission. If the Chief Justice and the local judge and the, and the um, chairman of the, of the Public Service Commission, who constitute with one or two others, the Judicial Services Commission of Anguilla, if they recommend that a certain person should be the next magistrate, the governor has full constitutional power to say, no, I have a friend that I want to appoint to be the next magistrate. And the governor has the power. Now, no governor has ever used that power. But the point is not that governors misuse the power. The point is that it is anti-democratic to have that power in the Constitution in the first place. And such a recommendation should come from a group of West Indian lawyers and judges who know who the lawyers are, what their, recommend, what their reputations are, what their professional abilities are like. And that is the expert committee who should be in the position to tell the governor, this one, we have five applicants, this one is the best one among the five. And we recommend to you that this is the person that you should appoint to be the next magistrate or the next registrar or the next crown counsel because they all go through, all crown counsels. Every lawyer working in the AG's department has to be approved by the Judicial Services Commission. Don, um, I'm not sure whether or not you were able to I ask you, I don't think I'd ask you, how long is this exercise likely to go for? And when do you think, based on, on what has been happening, you're likely to wrap up? Well, bring in mind that you say that if it's not completed, <laughs> But my, you know, this term, the next, the next, ex, the next government, if there's a, the change in government, will go through I am, the same process. I am getting old and tired, right? Yeah, so yeah, I have, yeah. I have a timetable. Yeah. My timetable, which is not necessarily shared by yeah, everybody, okay. right? But my timetable is that I would like to see this all finished well before the end of 2016. Now, this year. yes, this year, this is this exercise can't take long. All the work has been done already. If I, was, if I was given the job of sitting down and going through all of these constitutions and picking out the best ones, it could not take more than two weeks. It could not take more than two weeks to complete the typing and the drafting, everything, to present a perfect, finished document that incorporates the best cannot take two weeks. But this is not a one-man show. This is a committee that has been appointed. So we have to consult with each other and we have to agree with each other. And then, of course, we have to get the agreement of the people of Anguilla and see what they want and if they want something different. So I would say that giving us another seven months or so would be, would be very reasonable, would be very workable. How long it takes the government to negotiate with the British? Because remember, the committee yeah. doesn't negotiate with the British. The government now negotiates with the British. How long it will take them is entirely another matter. That's out of our hands. We're not concerned with that. Um, as, as we kind of wrap up this area, because we've got another area that I want to talk about, Don. Uh, as we wrap up this, how, how, what would, two of the pressing areas that you figure that if your committee were to recommend and the government of Angola agreed to, that you figure you might have problems with the British way? Problems? Yeah. Or some concerns. Well, you see, we don't really know if the British have any secret agenda. Because remember, they've never consulted with us. They've never told us what we want. What we consider of vital importance is that you must do A, B, and C. Yeah. There's not a hint from them. So the real concerns of the British have not yet been indicated in any way, so far as I know, to the people of Angola, except the finance administration order. We know that that is a priority. But that's not going to be a difficulty for us to put that in the Constitution. The British have told us that, yeah. that if we don't put it in the Constitution, they're going to impose it by an order in council. So they want it to be done yesterday. They, they don't understand why it's taking so long. They want it done yesterday. All right. So that's the first one that is important.
The second one that is important for a lot of people, is, and including me, is the watchdog institutions. Having, or having, for example, I'm going to give an example of one. The ombudsman, we've all heard of the ombudsman. The ombudsman is the person like a complaints officer. The public administration has privately and without any legal basis appointed a complaints officer. Any Anguillian who has a complaint that some civil servant is misbehaving, is not doing the right thing, you go to public administration and you ask for the complaints officer and you file a complaint and the complaints officer will try to sort it out. But that complaints officer is an in-house member of public administration. If you are complaining about a friend of the complaints officer, God help you and your complaint because it ain't going anywhere. Let's be, let's be honest about it. So we need an independent complaints officer appointed under the Constitution, legally mandated by the Constitution, with powers set out in an ombudsman law so that we can have a proper place to go and make our complaints. It doesn't have to be an expensive institution. In most countries, it's a retired public senior servant person who's receiving a pension, who's already being paid, who needs a stipend to cover at st uh, stationary, and uh, maybe an investigator, a retired police officer who is experienced at investigating to act as investigator for the ombudsman. So there will be some small expenses, and we're ready to go. With the watchdog institutions in place, with the finance administration precautions in place as part of that, I think we're ready to go. Problems with the British? We have no idea. For example, suppose it is true, as we have all heard, that the British want the Constitution amended in order to force the Registrar General of Marriages to marry gay couples. We've all heard that, haven't we? Mm -hmm. That under the European Union, it's illegal to discriminate in marriage laws against gays. Under the International Human Rights Convention, it's illegal. And maybe it's true that they want to force the Anguilla Constitution Committee to put in a right for gay marriage into the Constitution. That's what people say. And maybe it will be a problem, but I can assure you that they did not oblige the Turks and Caicos people to do it. They did not oblige the British Virgin Islands people to do it. And they did not oblige the Cayman Islands people to do it. So why are we panicking? Why should we panic and worry that they're going to do that? My recommendation is let us wait and see if the British have any suggestions, recommendations. We will look at them when we get them and see which ones are suitable for Anguilla. And I don't see the British as forcing us to agree to a constitution that we do not agree to. In my opinion, that is inconceivable. The British don't want to have any problem with anybody that I'm aware of. Finally, Don, on the 15th of February, um, you launched, uh, or you didn't, you, you, <laughs> a committee helped launch um, a series of lectures prepared for CAPE. That's one of the examinations of the Caribbean Examinations Council for law students in Anguilla. And the text of the draw in these series of books um, prepared by comp compilation of lectures written by you. What force did we have them on the screen there? Um, criminal law, principles of public law, Caribbean legal systems, law of thought, law of real property, law of contract. What led you to? Producing this, apart from the fact that you're retiring and you don't want, I'm your, getting old, Wycliffe. And you don't want, and you don't want your, I don't want, want to your waste. To just go by the, the wayside. I mean, yes. tell us a bit more about it. Sure. The plan is that young people in Anguilla don't have an opportunity to learn the rules of civics, the rules of government, the rules of how we operate with land and contracts. And what are torts, the wrong behavior of people that you can sue for? What are they? What can we do to upgrade our standard of civilization? And it is important not for lawyers only, but for every Anguillian man and woman to know what our basic rights are, not least because of the famous maxim that ignorance of the law is no excuse. We are assumed to know the law. 
So I am teaching high school students who are desirous of learning about Angolian law. There is an exam that they sit with the Caribbean Examination Council, CXC. It's called CAPE, Caribbean Advanced Proficiency Examinations. And I've been lecturing in CAPE in those six topics that you just saw for the last eight years. So all of the work, all the lectures were prepared. It was only necessary for me to find a publishing company that would help me to get them published. And I was very glad to have been able to do that through the Dominican um, publishers, Emmanuel Publishing House, with a, a, a wonderful technician in Dominica called Dave Bruni. Bruni put it all into the format that would be perfect for publishing. And now it's in book form. It will be available from the Coral Reef Bookstore and directly from Amazon, because it's Amazon that's printing them. You, you said it's a series of lectures prepared for Cape student, law students in Angola. Was it, are you, do you have plans to look at the other islands? Yes. I am very fortunate. Uh, I got some inquiries from other islands. I have a lot of friends who know what I'm doing. And there is a, a lady in Grenada, Miss Redhead, who is right now converting these lectures into the law of Grenada. So we will have six books published for Grenadian law students. There is a lady in Antigua, Miss Gail Christian. She's a very well-known politician. She recently married, so she's Gail Christian Imhoff. Uh, she is going to convert them into laws for Anti the books for Antigua Barbuda. And there's a very well-known lawyer in St. Kitts, who is Sylvester Anthony, who is, he's offered to convert them into the law of St. Kitts Nevis. So we may find in a few months' time that these books are being launched, to made agree. relevant to, to the laws of other islands. Yes. But uh, the information you have in here, Don, um, interesting question. How long will such information sustain itself? I mean, it's, it's for CAPE here now. CAPE has the, the, the CXC and examination officers have a tendency to change their books nearly every year. Yes. You know, uh, well, the syllabus was last changed in 2009 for the year 2010. So the syllabus, the same syllabus has been operating since 2010. If they change the syllabus next year, then it will become obsolete. Well, for the one or two areas that they change it, for a lawyer who is teaching, it won't be a problem to prepare um, appendices, you know, additional lectures to deal with that. So in fact, the other islands might have a little more updated version. Oh, of absolutely. Well, as you go along absolutely. Don, we, we come to the end of our program facing the issues. We had an opportunity to talk with Don Mitchell, who is the chairman of the Constitutional Electoral Reform Committee as they continue their, their work towards putting together a new constitution for Angola. Um, of course, it's almost 20 years now since this exercise has started. Don, any parting words you want to give us? No, I'm grateful for you allowing me to, um, to boost the books a little bit. I thank <laughs> you for that. I hadn't expected it, but you told me to bring one, so I brought it. Yeah, we have it here. This is, this is the real thing. Um, earlier we had, of course, um, as we spoke about them, the, all the name of the books, but this one is about laws of contract. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll bring you back another day to talk a little bit more about the books. But sure, thank you. So suffice to okay. say that there are six books, criminal law, principles of public law, Caribbean legal systems, law of thought, law of real property, and law of contract. I have an opportunity to, for you to delve a little bit more into what each area means. Sure, okay? thank you. Don Mitchell, CBEQC, Chairman of the Constitutional and Electoral Reform Committee, has been our guest on this evening's Facing the Issues. Join us next week for another program.